British wow. country. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys, we are live. So whenever you're ready, feel free. Okay, well, thank you, Michelle. And I want to start by thanking Rob Dunn for inviting us to be part of these mini uh, webinar series on fermentology. So we are here to talk about bee bread, the biology of bee bread. My name is uh, Margarita lopez Uribe. I'm an assistant professor at Penn State in the Department of Entomology. And I'm here with Brooke Lorenz, who is a master's student in my lab. And we have been working on a project about bee bread. So we're here to talk about um, kind of the, the biology of bee bread and an update from the ongoing project that Brooke is leading. Okay, so I want to start by introducing everyone to honeybees. Probably they don't need a lot of introduction. Uh, we all know that honeybees are extremely important for uh, pollination and that they contribute to uh, agriculture. And they are uh, a critical part of the, um, the cropping systems in the United States. And uh, we pro you guys have probably heard of some of the problems that ha uh, honeybees are having right now. We have... Um, we have been having declines in the number of honeybee colonies for many years now, and there are concerns about what these could, um, uh, the impacts of these, these could have to food production. But honeybees have been not only studied because of the pollination surfaces that they provide, but they have been studied because they are social insects, and they are very interesting uh, in that um, that aspect of their biology is very interesting. So for many decades, scientists have studied honeybees as model systems to understand how um, uh, is insect societies, how uh, insects that live in these large uh, societies uh, communicate and coordinate behaviors that allow them to be very successful. However, one of the things that many people may not know or some people may miss is that honeybees are actually very unique and very different compared to other types of bees, right? So when we talk about bees, we are talking about a group of insects that comprises about 20,000 different species in the world. And in North America, we have about 4,500 species of um, of bees. So honeybees is one, one species of uh, many, many thousand species um, in the world. And as you can see in these, um, in these photo, um, the bees include a, a huge um, diversity, different types, different colors. Uh, and as I was saying, the majority of these bees are very different from, from honeybees. And one of the ways in which these bees are different is that they're actually solitary. So the majority of bees um, don't form these large groups with tens of thousands of individuals. Uh, there is only one female in each nest, and that female is the one that is in charge of making the nest, building the nest, and doing all the pollen and nectar collection. Okay, so in, regardless of whether you are a solitary bee, or a social bee, uh, bees make nests and these nests look different. So here I wanted to show you uh, some of the differences in, um, in, in how bees uh, make nests. And so here in this left upper panel, you see a photo of a uh, honeybee nest, you know, like here we see the queen, right? And honeybees uh, make these very organized structures um, the cells in the honeybee, the cells are those chambers, that you're, those cavities that you're seeing in that photo, are um, organized in hexagons, right? They are perfectly positioned next to each other. And those are the cavities that, um, that honeybees use to store the pollen and the nectar that the, the bees are bringing back to the colony. They go out, they collect them in the, the, the flowers, and they bring it back to the nest. And those, um, those cells are also the places where the queen is going to lay the egg uh, and all of the larval develop development is going to take place. Now other bees, for example bumblebees, um, are also social. And what you can see here is that they also have cells that they use for the same, uh, for the same purposes, pollen and nectar um, storage and larval development, but you see that the arrangement and the shape of these cells is very different, right? So not all nests look like the ones in the honeybee. They are um, oval in shape and they form these kind of like these organized clusters inside uh, of the colony. 
Here in the middle panel, we see um, a photo of the typical nest of a ground nesting bee. So as I was saying, the majority of bees are solitary and actually uh, about 70% of all bees uh, nest underground. And this is, so this is kind of like the typical um, way in which uh, bees actually build nests underground. So usually these one female that um, is, or is, you know, like the only living in that solitary bee nest has to um, make that tunnel, uh, dig that tunnel, and they make these lateral branches where they, um, they actually, you know, like excavate and they form a cavity that they're gonna use as a cell. So they put some uh, salivary secretions that are, are gonna protect the pollen and the nectar that they are going to be um, storing in that cell. And once again, this is the place where they're gonna lay the eggs and all the larval development is gonna take place. Exactly the same thing happens in um, bees that nest in wood. Many bees like carpenter bees, for example, are wood nesters. And so in those cases, uh, the bees also have to make cells and those are the places where they are collecting the pollen and nectar. Uh, and that's where the larvae are going to develop. So in summary, whether you're solitary or social, bees make nests. And the other thing that is uh, interesting biologically about bees is that they actually prepare the food for the larva, right? And so they are, when the bees go out of the nest and they're um, um, foraging on flowers, they are choosing the right pollen and nectar. They're gonna bring it back. They're gonna mix it in a way that is gonna be perfect for the developing larva. This is actually not trivial, and this is very different from other types of insects. So if we think about other pollinators like monarch butterflies, for example, um, the life cycle of the monarch butterfly is very different. When the adults emerge, they mate, and then the females are going to look for a plant where they're going to lay the eggs. Um, and when th that egg hatches here, you know, like represented here in the left, th that egg hatches, the caterpillar is going to be by itself looking for leaves and other plant tissues to, to use. So mom is not preparing food in any way for the developing larva. Okay, so we have been talking about pollen and nectar, but we haven't mentioned bee bread. So what is bee bread? Well, bee bread is actually the, the a mixture of that pollen and nectar that the bees are bringing back to the colony, but it also involves the uh, microbial activity of bacteria and yeast. So um, this is this photo here um, is showing you in, to the right of the slide is showing you how the bee bread looks inside the cells. And so you can see that uh, it's not a homogeneous mixture of pollen, right? Um, basically, that is representing a lot of pollen loads that the bees are bringing individually back to the nest. They get stored in layers uh, in the cells. And then once they are packed, they cover that with honey. And that this is when the production of the bee bread, the process of producing bee bread begins. And the bee bread production process involves two steps. One is uh, bacterial fermentation, and the second one is uh, fermentation by yeast. So um, the first step that is led by uh, bacteria uh, is usually, uh, usually involves uh, bacteria in the genus Lactobacillus, and this species Lactobacillus skunkii is a very um, common in, in bee bread. This species um, um, likes uh, or um, thrives in environments where there is a lot of fructose. And so uh, and when they start this fermentation process, they consume that, they digest that fructose and produce lactic acid. And what happens is that the production of lactic acid is going to decrease the pH of that bee bread. And that is going to set up the perfect environment for the next step of the fermentation, which is led by uh, yeast. And so in this series, uh, we have heard of this name before, Saccharomyces is a yeast that is involved in the fermentation of other um, products used by humans like beer um, and also, you know, like sourdough bread, for example. So these, uh, this type of yeast is also involved in the fermentation of bee bread. And so what happens is that I, I was, as I was saying, the bacteria that were present before lower the pH, and that is the perfect environment for them to uh, continue growing and um, finish kind of the fermentation. But at this point in time, 
uh, after the first fermentation is stepped by bacteria and when the yeast start growing, the, the total bacterial activity in the bee bread actually decreases. And so these, the bee bread is dominated by these beneficial bacteria, sorry, these beneficial yeast that are going to um, in some ways preserve the bee bread and they are going to stop um, pathogenic uh, yeast or bad yeast from growing and spoiling the, the bee bread. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we just saw is that the bee bread is not only just like pollen, right? Like the, there is a process that is um, driven by bacterial activity that, transform the, that transforms that raw pollen uh, into bee bread uh, through a, a process of fermentation. And what happens is that nutritionally, bee bread is different from raw pollen. Um, so there is an increase in lactic acid due to the action of uh, lactobacillus, and there is less starch because that is part of what is being used for the fermentation. Now, one interesting aspect about bee bread and bee bread production is that in honeybees, the, um, the developing larvae are, are not exactly kind of like munching on the bee bread. Uh, the way this works is that in, in honeybee colonies, um, the eggs are, the queen is laying the egg in the cells, right? And, um, and then for the first few days of their lives, these, um, these eggs that are going to then develop in larvae. So here we, we see a very, very young larvae uh, in this cell. They are going to be um, uh, consuming something called royal jelly, which is, um, the, it is a secretion um, that the nurse bees are producing from the mandibular glands and they are giving to these very young larvae. And so for the first few days, basically, this is how the developing, uh, the cells of developing larvae look like. Uh, it, there is like this, you know, like soup here that's all royal jelly, and that's what the young larvae are eating. Then as they start growing after day three, um, the, the, um, uh, the nurse bees start bringing in bee bread. So all of the consumption of bee bread is always mediated by the presence of nurse bees uh, who are the ones giving the food to the developing larvae. Okay, but why would bees um, go into all the trouble of, you know, like fermenting uh, bee bread? So bee bread, it is, as I was saying, it is extremely important for the preservation, the long-term preservation of, um, of the food in the colony. And this is particularly important for honeybees because honeybees, um, unlike many other bees, are perennial organisms, right? Like, so they, uh, they, they, um, they overwinter, the colony overwinters, right? And there are uh, hundreds to thousands of individuals in the colony um, during the winter. And then they need to have access to bee bread um, to start producing the next generation when the spring comes, right? And this also happens throughout the season that are uh, periods, um, even during, you know, like the summer where pollen may not be as available. And so having these stored pollen in the colony is critical to keep producing um, more workers. So it, uh, the, 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 the process of um, preserving the bee bread is critical for bee health. And this is where the problems come. Um, so honeybees, as I was saying at the beginning, we are seeing, uh, 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 we have been observing for many decades now um, that the honeybees are having a hard time overwintering successfully. There are many colonies that die every year. And part of the problem uh, is this exposure of pesticides um, that the bees are having, right? So they're feeding on plants that are exposed to pesticides because they're usually used for um, pollination of agricultural um, crops and they are exposed to pesticides. And so while the, the, the pesticides can have direct impacts on bee, it can also have um, impacts, in, in indirect impacts in other ways. So for example, it can impact the microbiome of, of the bee bread. So, and this has been receiving a lot of attention um, recently because um, we, for example, this study showed that when colonies are foraging on areas where the plants have been exposed to fungicides and they, and they bring in the pollen to the colony, um, 
and, you, and they culture this bee bread. What they observed is that the diversity of yeast in, um, in this bee bread was significantly lower than the diversity of yeast in colonies that had no exposure to fungicides. So what does this mean? What it means is that when the colonies have no exposure to fungicides, all the yeast that I mentioned before, right, the, the, the good yeast that are um, helping with the fermentation and the preservation of the pollen are there. And they actually, uh, to, some, to some extent, they uh, protect the pollen from getting the bee bread from getting spoiled by um, pathogenic um, microbes. But when you have fungicides, those yeasts may get um, eliminated. Um, and then we have an increase in pathogenic uh, microbes that can actually lead to spoilage of pollen. So we have been very interesting in this question of, you know, how is it that uh, these chemicals that uh, we're adding that are, uh, that are present in the environment are impacting the health of, um, of honeybees through changes in the microbiome. And with this in mind, we started this project um, last year. And we are not, we are specifically interested in how the uh, chemicals that beekeepers themselves add to, um, to the colonies may be impacting the, the microbiome the, of the hive environment and the bee brain. And so Brooke is going to uh, talk about some of the um, details of that project. So some of you may be wondering, why would beekeepers need to add chemicals to their colonies or put pesticides in their colonies? Well, uh, pesticides or miticides in this case are a very important management tool that beekeepers use to control the population of varroa mites. Um, varroa mites are a parasitic mite that um, can spread diseases within the honeybee colony and um, keeping the population of varroa mites low is very important for ensuring the long-term survival of that colony. And one of the miticides that we decided to look at that's quite commonly used is Formic Pro, which is a miticide developed from formic acid. Now you'll remember from earlier, uh, Margarita mentioned the uh, importance of pH and the pH conditions for some of those key bacterial and yeast species that are present in the microbiome. So we wanted to see how this adding this in, tense acid to the colony might change the balance of the microbiome in the bee bread. So what we did is we set up an experiment um, with uh, for using Formic Pro uh, and the, uh, we collected samples of bee bread from the colonies both before and after a 20 day treatment with the Formic Pro miticide. You can see there in the picture, we used a uh, little, we used sterile tubes to collect all those layers of bee bread um, and then brought that back to the lab to uh, extract the DNA. And we characterized the microbiome found in that bee bread using an Illumina MySeq sequencing process where we used um, a region of bacterial DNA or ribosomal RNA, 16S region to identify the bacteria and the ITS region of the ribosomal RNA to identify the fungi. And what we found, uh, so we starting out, we were looking at the relative abundance of the bacterial species in the microbiome. And here we have the colonies that receive no treatment. We just collected samples before that 20 day period and then after. And you'll notice that the microbiome is relatively comparable between the two time points. And uh, particularly of note, the Lac Lactobacillus kunkii um, is stayed pretty much consistent in its abundance in the microbiome, just 23% before and 23% after. But when you look at the formic acid treated colonies, you see that there's a lot more dramatic change. The microbiomes are less comparable and that relative abundance of Lactobacillus kunkii uh, dropped quite a bit between the two. Now, this is still fairly preliminary data, so we're still trying to understand what these changes mean. And we also still need to analyze the ITS data so that we know how the fungi were affected by exposure to formic acid. But it's pretty clear from what we're showing here that the miticides are capable of, in, of causing a shift in the balance of the microbiome. And that's, um, and that potentially could lead to impacts in bee bread quality. 
Um, so we're excited to keep exploring this data and to learn more so that we know how these changes affect the bees themselves. So to wrap up what we learned today, um, as we discussed, bees store pollen and nectar in the form of bee bread, which is a very important for the development of the brood and the overall success of the colony. And that bee bread is not only produced by just the presence of pollen and nectar, but also the fermentation process that's driven by bacteria and yeast. And finally, we found that um, pesticides, uh, both from the environment and introduced by beekeepers can change the balance of species in the microbiome of the bee bread. Um, and so we really enjoyed getting to talk to you guys today. Thank you for your attention. And um, if you have any questions for us afterwards, we have uh, our Twitter handles here and our emails. Or if you're interested in learning more about this project or other work in our lab, uh, you can visit our lab website. Fabulous. Imagine 300 people cheering right now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Margarita and Brooke. Um, you know, I feel like I can relate to baby bees because I too was reared mostly on bread and jelly. So I can really understand where they're coming from. Um, next week, just a quick plug for those of you who are still on the live stream and still in the Zoom room. Uh, we do have author, organic farmer, and farmstead cheese maker, David Asher, presenting on the culture of cheeses. So that's definitely one you also don't want to miss. And if you need to RSVP for that one, you can email me or you can fill in the RSVP form that's available online. Just Google fermentology and NC State and it'll pop up. Um, thank you again, Margarita and Brooke. Fabulous. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Good luck on your projects there, Brooke. Thank you. <laughs>